And we do have a another uh, absolutely a rock star lineup for our next, our next session. And Larry Steinman, it's over to you. Thank you, Zan. And uh, welcome to what is billed as session 14. And we're going to talk about neurodegenerative diseases. And I want to make a comment that uh, one of the ideas is to bust uh, silos. And when we were taught physiology, we had the cardiovascular, we had the neuro, we had the endocrine, they were all separate. So I'm glad that Peter in the last session uh, brought an endocrinologist into the gang of uh, three or four. Uh, we're going to all be neurologists, but I wanna share with you that nevertheless, uh, this is a very eclectic bunch. Let me uh, introduce them briefly uh, and then we'll have some uh, brief presentations and hopefully a robust discussion. For the discussion, uh, please remember to use the Q&A rather than the chat, though I'll try to look at uh, both. So uh, our three speakers are uh, first, uh, and not in the order they'll speak because Frank will speak first, but uh, Paulo Fontura, who's uh, up the latest, calling uh, in from uh, Europe. Paulo's the Senior Vice President of uh, Research, Neuroscience Research, at Roche, and under his uh, watch at Roche, they had their first uh, approval uh, of some neuroscience drugs uh, for a while. One was a uh, splicing modulator for spinal muscular atrophy. So Paolo has worked in the rare disease space, but also a big breakthrough in multiple sclerosis with the uh, approval of ocrelizumab. Uh, so Paolo comes uh, very well trained, MD, PhD, he's versatile in molecular biology, uh, cell biology, immunology, and of course, clinical neurology. He's also uh, an impressive historian. Uh, he studied uh, the uh, medical scientists from the 16th century and from the 19th century and published in esteemed journals. So it's going to be a pleasure to hear uh, Palo's uh, impressions from inside uh, industry. Uh, Bruce Miller, uh, our second uh, speaker, uh, is up the road at UCSF and he's a uh, distinguished expert in the area of neurodegenerative diseases. Not only the widely known ones, but also the rare diseases that uh, cause dementia, including frontotemporal dementia. He's also uh, active clinically and uh, has won a number of awards, the Potamkin Prize, and he's in the National uh, Academy of Medicine. We were fortunate uh, this morning to have as uh, one of our keynote speakers, the president, uh, Victor uh, Zhao. So uh, Bruce has also been a star on TV programs. If you have a chance to look at his uh, uh, appearance on 60 Minutes talking about frontotemporal dementia. Uh, it's uh, really a, a heartfelt and illuminating uh, session that he spent there. And our third speaker, is, uh, who will be speaking first, is Frank Longo, uh, the chairman of uh, the department uh, where I work. And uh, Frank has uh, taken the department from uh, a small uh, department to one with over 100 uh, members. You heard one of our department members, Tom Rando, talking about the virtues of exercise and his amazing work with uh, parabiotic animals. Well, uh, Frank, besides being the leader of the department, is what in modern times we call the quadruple threat. In the old days, when I was uh, studying, we had the triple threat, somebody who would see patients, uh, teach, and do research. Frank does all of those in a terrific manner. He's also an entrepreneur and he has a company developing a small molecule now in a phase two trial for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease with a small molecule uh, modulator of the uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor receptor. So 
Uh, Frank, too, has won an, a number of awards for excellence in Alzheimer's research, and I'm happy to bring everyone together. Why don't we start out with uh, Frank's talk, and uh, we'll then go to Bruce, and then follow on with Paolo, and then we'll have uh, hopefully some very good discussions. Frank, lead off, please. Well, thank you, Larry. Um, I appreciate being invited. And um, I'll share just a few slides, but um, it's, it's a privilege to be here with my fellow panelists. And uh, the prior session in this meeting has been fantastic. So I, I'm really appreciative uh, to be a part of this. Um, I, I will be sharing a few slides. I, I will be talking about some of our studies uh, with one of our lead small molecules, not so much to talk about our own work, but it, uh, as a specific way to, to bring up critical issues and principles in our goal of treating neurodegenerative disorders. So, so that's the, the real goal here is to raise some of these questions that, that all of us face. Um, I have a few uh, disclosures and conflicts of interest here. As Larry mentioned, I'm a, a founder and a chairman of uh, Pharmatrophics uh, that's focused on developing small molecules and including one that I'll be discussing. And I also serve on the advisory uh, committee for Pfizer Ventures in their uh, neuroscience uh, area. So we'll go to the next slide. And again, this is a, a complex slide, uh, but I just want to illustrate a principle of, of the signaling networks disrupted in Alzheimer's and the other uh, neurodegenerative diseases, including uh, frontal temporal dementia that Bruce Miller will be talking about. So our basic hypothesis here is that, uh, showing up toward the upper left of the slide there is that amyloid, A beta, it's, especially its toxic forms, uh, toxic forms of the tau protein, some of which may be triggered by excess A beta, and along with microglial activation, these various forces uh, conspire to trigger a whole network of, de of degenerative signaling that I'm illustrating here. Um, and of course, uh, for these late onset diseases, Age is a big biologic factor, and so is lifestyle. It's been discussed, diet, exercise, sleep, uh, et cetera. So we have to include those in the biology, and we very much do. And we trigger a network of degenerative signaling involving the signaling proteins, and even our colleagues in, in the cardiovascular medicine and cancer will recognize many of them. Uh, many of them are excessively activated, leading to excess uh, as you move down towards the tau there. Um, uh, critical post-translational modifications of tau, including cleavage, excess phosphorylation, misfolding, mislocalization, oligomerization, and these together conspire to go all the way down to the bottom to cause synaptic dysfunction, a synaptic spine loss, the spine being perhaps the most delicate and critical structure of the synapse, and finally neurite degeneration. And of course, for all of these degenerative diseases, the patients are coming to see us because of cognitive dysfunction or uh, synaptic failure, basically. So I look at any potential therapeutic approach. I want to know what it does in terms of synaptic failure and synaptic loss. So we tested the hypothesis um, uh, that modulating this P75 receptor, uh, given its uh, network of signaling, which I'm not showing here specifically, but it has quite a bit of overlap uh, with the network of signaling affected in Alzheimer's and these other diseases. And the big challenge in Alzheimer's and the other diseases in terms of therapeutics is if we go after any one thing, say lowering A beta, uh, so far, you know, no big effects, or lowering tau with antibodies uh, or in earlier stages, of course, but so far no big effects in the clinical uh, trials, et cetera. So what's emerging is this challenge uh, resembling the game of, of whack-a-mole, so to speak. You can go after one, uh, but this is a robust multi-network set of diseases, and it's possible that going after one entity like that will not be strong enough. But we, this P75 receptor, however, it's, it's geared through evolution to be wired into broad signaling networks. It dictates synaptic pruning and survival during development. It's geared towards broad, powerful effects. So we hypothesized that modulating it with a small molecule could counteract degenerative signaling. And everywhere you see an orange circle is a, is a degenerative signaling event that's counteracted by this small molecule ligand we call 31 for short, or LM11A31. This is a small molecule through oral um, administration, gets into the brain with a high brain to plasma ratio, 
um, and it's made it through multiple mouse trials and has currently been through two phase one trials for safety and is currently in a phase 2A trial in Alzheimer's disease in, in Europe. You can go to the next slide. And so just to share uh, some of the mouse model effects we've seen, here we're looking at a uh, commonly studied tau mouse model uh, that's uh, you know, somewhat a, a, a setup for human FTD, frontal temporal dementia, you know, one of the big tauopathies. And these mice by six months of age have a remarkable loss of synaptic uh, structure. And we're showing here the synaptic spines from the hippocampus with Golgi staining, and you can see the transgenic versus the non-transgenic mice loss in synaptic density. Those little buds coming off the dendrite here are the spines, and we can quantitate their density. And at nine months, in the transgenic mice, the loss is even greater. So we elected to treat these mice with this oral compound from age six to nine months, and we purposely started uh, after the pathology is well established to see if we could have an element of reversal because we're told in this field that it's impossible to reverse degeneration, that we will only be successful if we treat before uh, symptoms start or if we treat in early stages. And you can see there in the transgenic mice in the very bottom there uh, that got the compound 31, we have a, a reversal uh, back to normal levels of synaptic spine density uh, hence suggesting that maybe there are important elements of degeneration biology that are in fact reversible. We can go to the next slide. And in fact, we want to know if the synapses are gained function. So this is electrophysiology. The normal mice are in black. The abnormal tauopathy mice are in red. And the, the lower signaling there is an abnormal synaptic function uh, looking through long-term differentiation. Next slide. And we can see um, if we treat these mice, again, after pathology has already started, we normalize synaptic function by this measure. Next slide. And so to wrap up then, we found in our preclinical studies that this one, targeting this one target with the, this one lead compound is able to address four separate parallel degenerative mechanisms. Those caused by amyloid, those caused by tau, as you saw in the tau mice, uh, we inhibit microglial activation, and we also in reverse, this is what I'm particularly excited about, degeneration of neurons that occur simply with aging in wild-type mice. Uh, all four of these in parallel are affected by this target. Next and last. Um, so the goal of, a, a challenge of course, is getting through the valley of death uh, and moving from these academic studies on the left through this valley of death. And of course, our goal is to partner with a large pharma. But fortunately, NIA and other entities have been able to fund this gap better and better. So we are almost uh, through this. Uh, next, the last slide. So the issues that at least our experience raises and that are general topics for the field, um, it, prevention versus slowing our reversal. You know, we feel that um, prevention, of course, is important. Uh, it might be somewhat more tractable biologically and slowing, but we don't want to give up on reversing critical elements of degeneration, as you saw from our biology. Multiple drivers. Um, we, uh, it's interesting, these lifestyle issues of diet and exercise influence some of the same signaling mechanisms that we're looking at, and maybe in the end, it's a partnership of drugs and lifestyle strategies. Uh, single versus cocktail therapies, we hear the, the, we will only have effective therapies if they are cocktail therapies because we have multiple mechanisms. But I've just shared with you what happens if you pick the right target and go after some targets, you, one can affect multiple mechanisms. So it may be that we could have a single therapy having robust effects through multiple mechanisms. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cocktail. And finally, the valley of death, a, a big challenge for all of us developing therapeutics. I think the, the chasm is shrinking, not only with emerging better funding uh, mechanisms from our colleagues at NIH and other places, but the biomarkers, I think, are allow us to have earlier proof of concept in human, perhaps making crossing the valley of death more viable. So anyway, we can discuss these issues more, but these are some of the big ones we all face in, in the therapeutics area. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, why don't we uh, move to uh, Bruce Miller's perspectives? Um, good. Can you see my slides, uh, everyone? Yes. Just put it on uh, screen mode and we're great. Thanks. Here we are. So really honored to be part of this panel and uh, 
uh, follow Frank, who has a really uh, smart compound uh, in a space that we really need uh, smart and novel approaches. Uh, I'm going to just give a brief overview of neurodegenerative diseases. And this is a slide that's taken off from a Magritte painting. Um, and uh, I think what it emphasizes is this is a little bit more complicated than uh, uh, we have been told to believe. And uh, I think there has been a tend tendency to Alzheimerize uh, all degenerative diseases. Uh, but, but I think uh, two things have uh, come up uh, really over the past decade. One is that there are multiple different neurodegenerative diseases, all with their own molecules, anatomy, uh, risk factors, and, and almost certainly treatments. Um, the other thing that's happened, I think in large because of brain banking associated with the uh, National uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers is that we have become acutely aware that when someone dies in their 80s and 90s of uh, uh, what we call Alzheimer's disease, they often have uh, Lewy body or Parkinson's pathology, pathology overlaps with frontotemporal dementia, uh, vascular pathology as well. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, that I think that the biggest uh, breakthroughs are gonna come through with uh, younger people with well understood causes for neurodegeneration where the population that is treated is homogeneous. Th this is what was taught to me uh, by my mentor and friend, uh, Stanley uh, Prusner. Uh, and uh, uh, I think he emphasized that we have genetic and sporadic forms of neurodegenerative disease. I think increasingly, and Frank touched on this, sporadic forms are associated with aging. Uh, and uh, this is certainly associated with a propensity to misfold proteins as we get older. We have some wonderful models. Uh, we probably won't argue about what the best one is today, wh whether it's iPSC-derived neurons, worms, flies, mice, uh, uh, marmosets, uh, but increasingly we have a, a wide spectrum of uh, models that we can think about three stages of neurodegeneration. Preclinical, uh, bad uh, misfolding of proteins, the beginning of uh, injury to synapses, as Frank talked about, but not yet enough damage so that we get a clinical uh, phenotype. Uh, after that, we get early symptomatic changes, all driven by where anatomically this disease begins. If it's a Parkinson disorder, we have a sleep or a mood problem that comes first. If it's frontotemporal dementia, almost always behavior. If it's Alzheimer's disease, uh, a little more variable, but don't think that the only way Alzheimer's disease presents uh, is with memory. Uh, the early symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's we call mild cognitive impairment. And then finally, a symptomatic phase uh, where these systems are breaking down. We have a functional impairment that is apparent, uh, and eventually these diseases are lethal. Uh, abnormal protein aggregation is the way we think about these diseases, and proteins spread from one cell to the next. Here are some of the different uh, proteins associated with dementia. And uh, 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 as Frank talked about, there may be some drugs that'll touch on many of these uh, different uh, protein aggregation mechanisms, but uh, other approaches may be very specific to tau, TDP43, alpha-synuclein, or the prion uh, protein. I'm, I'm very fascinated since the time I was a fellow at UCLA in the 1980s by frontotemporal dementia. At that time, we were taught, don't pick Pick's disease. Uh, why shouldn't we pick it? Well, uh, it's so rare, you'll never see a case. You can't clinically differentiate this from Alzheimer's disease. And I think underlying these ideas was why study as a neurologist something that manifests as behavior. So. We've learned you should pick Pick's disease. It's a very common dementia, particularly under the age of 60, more common than Alzheimer's disease. I think all of our prevalence studies underestimate uh, how common this is uh, because I, I believe if you're gonna treat and cure ALS, you will need to do it uh, through uh, treatment of frontotemporal dementia. Uh, 
By the same token, uh, diseases traditionally thought of as movement abnormalities, PSP, cortical basal degeneration, are uh, strongly linked, uh, if not identical, to the frontotemporal dementias. And then finally, I think the two major molecules uh, that we've learned in chronic traumatic encephalopathy are FTD molecules, tau and TDP43s. Uh, so uh, this is not only a presenile uh, disorder, it al also occurs after 70. Uh, and I think in particular, there's an entity that we call late, uh, where we know that maybe 40 to 50% of people who are called Alzheimer's disease uh, during life over the age of 80 also have TDP43 pathology. Uh, so prevalence may be 60,000, but greatly underrepresented by this number. Uh, remarkably interesting in terms of, for a neurologist, uh, in terms of the focality of this disease, we think it begins in a single cell. Uh, in the case of the behavioral variant, the von Economo neuron spreads out along a specific frontotemporal circuit. Uh, if you start uh, bilaterally or more on the right side, you show behavioral changes. If you start on the left side, uh, you tend to have language disorders. Uh, one really interesting thing that has happened from phenotyping, we've learned that the anatomy is very strongly predictive of the genetics um, and also the molecules associated with the illness. So if you have a progressive non-fluent aphasia or Broca's aphasia, we can say with a high degree of certainty that if you don't have a progranulin mutation with TDPA, you have a tauopathy. I think very important for clinical trials. Um, I'm just gonna uh, say a, a word about where I think that, uh, some of the huge advances are gonna come uh, and the, this is in the next few years. And, and I think we have smart clinical trials focused on these three main genetic mutations. Tau mutation discovered by Michael Hutton in 1998, uh, young onset frontotemporal degenerative disease with lots of Parkinsonism is associated with misfolding of tau. Uh, the tr treatment, uh, if you carry this gene, is turn off uh, the tau gene, uh, the abnormal one, or figure out a way of degrading tau. We have people at UCSF, including Jennifer Dudna, thinking about how to do this with CRISPR. It's going to be a very exciting decade uh, associated with something that I think is preventable. Progranulin, different, but also extremely exciting. Degenerative disease that is caused by haploinsufficiency. Uh, too little progranulin leads to this degenerative cascade. The therapy, again, simple prevent this disease, replace granulin in the brain uh, so that the neurodegenerative condition never emerges. And then finally, C9ORF72, uh, the disease that links ALS and frontotemporal dementia uh, caused by a massive hexanucleotide repeat. If you can turn off this gene, uh, you in theory will prevent the neurodegenerative process. So watch carefully over the next five years, the exciting approaches to these three genes that I think may be uh, valuable more broadly when thinking about treating other neurodegenerative conditions and other forms of frontotemporal dementia. Um, I know the people at this meeting are very interested in the modifiable risk factors. Uh, these are the ones that I have listed. Uh, uh, I think we underestimated as a field head injury probably underestimated air pollution. Uh, nothing is harder, I, I don't think, than low education associated with uh, increased susceptibility to neurodegenerative disease. So I, I think these are modifiable risk factors, all of them important, at least in Alzheimer's disease. We don't know much yet about these other neurodegenerative conditions. But, uh, but I think these are a template to think about lifestyle. Uh, uh, one last comment about this, if you are uh, from an economically deprived part of our country uh, or, or another country, uh, you are much more prone to suffering from these risk factors and much more likely to develop a neurodegenerative condition. Uh, 
Uh, if we'd have time and discussion, I'd like to say a little bit about how educational approaches in Brazil are now being instituted uh, uh, around low education and lack of reading. Okay, so uh, almost done, just two other uh, uh, comments. So uh, uh, do these lifestyle um, issues uh, have an influence uh, even in strongly genetic forms of uh, neurodegenerative disease? This is some nice work recently uh, taking a, a cohort called All FTD, large numbers of people who carry the gene for frontotemporal dementia or actually are suffering from this. Uh, Caitlin Casaletto's study suggested that physical activity, cognitive activity in this large cohort seemed to be protect, pro protective from developing neurodegenerative disease, even if you carry the gene that we know uh, has almost 100% penetrance, delays the onset uh, of the neurodegeneration. I think it will turn out to be a very important study. And then finally, ju just a word about uh, uh, how we increasingly at UCSF, uh, I think across our field, think about dyads. So we know that one of the most vulnerable uh, populations in the world to neurodegeneration are caregivers. Uh, we know that uh, caregivers uh, suffer from uh, mental health with a higher likelihood, particularly uh, if you suffer from frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia seems to increase caregiver burden twofold. It inc increases caregiver psychopathology and also uh, lifespan. So these diseases have an enormous effect on the caregiver. And there's also a very interesting relationship between uh, caregiver mental health and the prediction of poor outcome for patients. So the more severe uh, the mental health issues in the caregiver, the shorter the lifespan of the patient with neurodegenerative disease. So I, I think it's great to focus on the patient but I think as we think about studies, also focus, focusing on this caregiver, uh, protecting his or her health, uh, will also help to protect the patient with neurodegenerative disease. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Before we uh, go on to Paolo, I just uh, wanted uh, to give you an update. Uh, one of your uh, former colleagues, uh, said these, those were the great days when I used to work with you. That's from your uh, colleague Cosmo. And then uh, a connection, one, somebody sent in on the chat that uh, David uh, Romohart, the father of neural networks, and he was a psychologist at Stanford, um, had Pick's disease. And I know many others uh, mm -hmm. on this call have uh, encountered Pick's uh, in their uh, families. So um, before we go to the questions, I'll have Paolo give some views uh, from industry. And as I mentioned, Paolo is uh, very well uh, stationed because he's uh, been involved with an approved therapy for a rare disease that involves uh, enhancing the expression of a certain exon in a gene. And he's also been involved with a very potent and successful immune therapy and multiple sclerosis. So uh, Paolo will be able to meld how the rare can teach us about uh, the very common. Paolo, it's all yours. Thanks, Larry, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure to be in such an illustrious panel. And I'll attempt to do a chalk talk, so no slides from my side, and uh, I'll try to be brief as well. Uh, so I mean, perhaps what would help the audience here is, is to give, let's say, the the pharmaceutical or R&D view of what's happening around neurodegeneration. And, and unfortunately, my first sentence is, is not one which is very optimistic if you look at the, at the success rate overall of any drugs being developed for Alzheimer's, let's say. The failure rate is over 95% right now. And if you look at what's available for patients, these are therapies which were developed two, three decades ago, and mainly are symptomatics in the sense that they provide transient benefit, they ameliorate some of the symptoms the patient has, but really do not significantly alter the course of the disease. And therefore, every one of us has, 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 has kind of been hoping for the holy grail therapy, which is what we call a disease-modifying therapy, something that would change the biology of, let's say, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or Huntington's, and at the same time provide symptomatic benefit. 
Of course, from a patient perspective, it's very interesting because patients at the end of the day really don't care if a, if a drug works on the biology, of the core biology or on the synapse pruning or whatever, they want to feel better. And that's actually one of the big challenges here, which is we have medicines, we have drugs in testing that are shown to change some of the biology or some of the pathology of Alzheimer's, for example, but don't really result in clinical benefit that's you know, either appreciated by patients or by regulators. So, so what have we been doing at Roche in the past decade or so? Well, we have a very long and very wide effort uh, focused around neurodegeneration. That includes several trials, several molecules in development in, in all phases, in phase one, two, and three. For Alzheimer's, uh, things like monoclonal antibodies against uh, uh, amyloid beta, which are now reading out phase three uh, trials. And we're all hopeful that one of these will make it over the, you know, that finishing line. And these are both in sporadic Alzheimer's as well as in genetic forms of Alzheimer's. We have molecules now being developed in, uh, in phase two for Parkinson's disease targeting uh, alpha synuclein. And we have molecules targeting Huntington's, you know, uh, uh, you know um, um, uh, uh, disease to suppress the mutant form uh, of this protein. And more broadly than that, I think we uh, understand that together with therapeutics, which are really targeted and very specific and potent, we also need better diagnostics and therefore the company has invested a lot of time and effort in developing CFF testing for A beta and tau, developing PET ligands so one can measure amyloid and, and tau pathology in, 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 the, uh, in the brains of uh, you know, uh, these patients, and really try to move forward with trials that address as early as possible this pathology. So we're going steadily towards the left in patients with moderate stages of disease to stages to prodromal stages, and now we're all considering pre-symptomatic treatment trials, which, as one can think about, are, are methodologically really, really challenging. What I think we're all underestimating, though, is the complexity of the problem. That's maybe why this conference is such a, is, is so right on the mark, which is near the generation, I think we all like to think about this in biological terms as something relatively simple. We all like very predictable you know, cascades of protein misfolding, causing neuronal death and then spreading to other neurons and then causing more death and then generating a certain number of downstream mechanisms, be them, uh, you know, immune or, you know, autophagic or mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is the biggest risk factor for neurodegeneration is still age. And that probably has to do with not only the genetic burden that all of us carry, which is more or less prevalent in all of these you know, conditions, apart from the very rare genetic ones, but for, but for these sporadic ones. And then you have a number of risk factors that Dr. Miller spoke about that really seem to bear as much weight in the overall outcome and prognosis as any of the genetic risk factors. So thinking about the future and what can be done next, uh, I think certainly we need to continue to investigate the biology and learn about new mechanisms, and certainly do a better job of developing the mechanisms we have now. Meaning that it took us 10 years from the first generation of anti-amyloid trials to getting to the point we are now, where hopefully within the next one to two years, we'll get the first approval for, our, for an anti-amyloid agent. And throughout that decade, we saw really a lot of failures, which in retrospect might have been preventable uh, in the sense that for a while, we were treating the wrong patients, patients who did not have amyloid pathology demonstrably in their brains. And therefore, diagnosis and biomarkers has really become now the core diagnostic feature for us to think about neurodegenerative conditions, at least in the clinical trial setting. We have learned much better how to dose these medicines. We are trying to do something right now, which is extremely hard, which is to target a very specific protein or a misfolded protein inside the brains using large molecules which cross the blood brain barrier only about 0.1 to 0.3 percent. So simply from a pharmacological standpoint, this, this is not an easy thing to do. It, it seems almost like an unsurmountable challenge until we, we solve it in the sense that either we develop technologies such as something we're working on called the brain shuttle that shuttles proteins across the blood brain barrier basically, or we develop new ways of delivering uh, drugs to the central nervous system. So we certainly need to do a better job with, with the targets we have now. 
But also at the same time, as we all know, the, the biology of any of these conditions is complex and not one single target in my mind at least will be sufficient. And we all, I think, know or think we know how much benefit one can get, for example, from an anti-amyloid agent, ju judging from the clinical trial data out there. And maybe one gets between 20 and 30 percent uh, reduction in, the, in those progression curves. Clearly, that's not a cure. It's great to have something, but it's not sufficient. And therefore, my, my, my feeling is that we need to go from that first generation of let's say, weak disease modifiers to really much more comprehensive, multi-target approach, which also may vary according to disease stage. So one knows that in the pre-symptomatic stage, the belief is that there's a lot of amyloid and tau pathology, but gradually that, get, that gets bigger and now other pathologies start coming up. And so one may think about different combinations of drugs according to the stage of this disease as well. And at the same time, I think we need to do a better job as well in terms of not just diagnosing based on biological factors such as CSF markers or, or you know, brain imaging, but also really looking at the, at, the, uh, at the phenotype, so at behavioral measures. And right now, we're still defining clinical benefit by what us as physicians and neurologists can see in, a, 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 let's say, a 30-minute interview with a patient that we haven't seen perhaps for three to six months. And of course, all of these patients go through ebbs and flows of function. So we may just be lucky and get them on a good day or unlucky and get them on a bad day. Until we develop really better ways to measure behavior in a more quantifiable and also a more frequent basis, we're gonna to struggle to make progress. And I have great hopes that for example, with the new digital wearable technology and digital endpoints, we're gonna be able to do that. So I started off on uh, on kind of a, on, 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 a, uh, on a negative note, saying we haven't done a great job so far, but I want to end on a positive note, which is I do think we have learned a lot in the past decade, and now I am I'm much more confident that given not just the proliferation in our understanding of biology, but also the, the, the better job we can do in developing medicines and diagnosing patients, that there's going to be breakthroughs in the decade ahead of us. So thanks, Larry, and I'll turn it back to you. Right. Remember, uh, <clears throat> folks out there on the internet, I don't see very many questions on chat, and I don't see any on Q&A. So I'll start uh, with a question as uh, you populate the question box, and then I'll uh, make sure that your questions are answered. So Paolo, if there's this entity called the blood-brain barrier, and uh, pharma's had uh, such great success with developing small molecules, the kind of thing uh, Frank is doing, uh, what's the attraction for uh, beating your head into the wall with something that's going to get 0.1% uh, taken up to where you need it? Yeah, no, it's a, that's a great question. I think uh, until we figure out something better to do, uh, what we know already is that even with existing te technology for large molecules, for example, it seems to be enough to get a small amounts. What it means is that we need to deliver very large amounts peripherally. Of course, then you have issues around safety and production, et cetera. But at least judging from the first anti-amyloid trials from Biogen and uh, our own, we do see biological action in the brain. We, see, we do see amyloid reduction. It's not as fast or as profound as one would hope in a short duration trial, but these are decades long diseases. So right now, I think that's probably fine. It's not going to be a long-term solution. So, so I see progress in two possible things. One thing that we've published on back in 2011 uh, was the creation of this transferrin shuttle. So it's basically a, 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 a protein module that targets a transferrin receptor in capillaries in the blood-brain barrier, and you can attach large molecules to it. So when you get to the, to the brain, basically, you, you're able to, uh, to, um, to uh, increase the penetration of these molecules by 30 to 50-fold. So you basically are flooding the capillary system of the brain with much more of your uh, you know, monoclonal antibody. Of course, the other thing one, that one can do, and that's what we're doing with our Huntington's program, which uses an antisense, is to deliver it intrathecally directly. Now there's two advantages here, one of which is obviously you're at the target of interest and that allows you to, to, to really re reduce you know, that dose for safety purposes, that's great. But also you're really bathing the whole central nervous system at the same time. So of course now the challenge for something like that is 
long-term sustainability, right? One can do that for months, maybe years, but if you want to treat a chronic disease, we will need again to come up with something better, whether that's a device or an implantable. But the technological challenge, I think it's something that everybody's working very keenly on. Thank you, Paolo. We now have some questions. Uh, one question that comes up is, what is, uh, and this is for the whole panel to uh, take a shot at, what is your assessment of recent evidence that viral infections like uh, herpes simplex can cause neurodegeneration? Yeah, Larry, I can make a few comments there. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Can herpes simplex one, HSV one, uh, you know, what role does it play in Alzheimer's and related degeneration? There's, you know, there's been for years epidemiologic association uh, one recent study pointed to a two to three fold increase in Alzheimer's in populations that have had HSV1. And so that's a risk factor, I think, you know, one wouldn't cause, uh, attribute that to straight causal, right? Perhaps a risk factor. And one could envision perhaps promoting inflammatory or related responses in the brain is, is a potential mechanism to be a risk factor. And more recently, I saw a report saying, uh, Patients with HSV1 who had been on acyclovir um, in, you know, uh, treatments in the past, again, were epidemiologically perhaps less likely to end up with Alzheimer's. Again, not a randomized controlled trial, an association. We all know the limitations. And finally, with the recent organoid approaches, you, know, you can introduce to brain organoids, HSV virus, and see some amyloid plaque buildup. It's all interesting circumstantial evidence. And, Recently, there's been a phase two trial of acyclovir going on in Alzheimer's patients. I don't know if it's read out yet. So a good question, and I, I think a potential contributor, and we'll see what the, uh, the antiviral trials do. The next question I'm going to uh, tee up, uh, and before anyone answers, I wanna make a comment. So the question is, how does progressive multiple sclerosis fit into the neurodegenerative biology? So it's a great question, but it also impacts on the question that was just asked about uh, viral pathogenesis of neurodegeneration. So one of the oddities in multiple sclerosis is that within the brain, there are these comfortable niches that uh, reflect one's immune history. So if you look at those famous oligoclonal bands of immunoglobulin, they never told us what the antigen is. Some of them are directed to uh, well-known viral infections. Others are uh, directed to uh, strange intracellular uh, signaling pathways uh, that wouldn't uh, be at all restricted to the brain. And probably the most prevalent uh, virus that uh, carries a history that we can detect in there is Epstein-Barr virus, the one that causes mononucleosis. So uh, the brain uh, is a repository of, of our immune history. So now uh, with that background, uh, whoever would like to take a shot at progressive MS uh, and how it fits into neurodegenerative biology. Yeah, maybe I, I, I can give it a shot first, Larry, uh, and then turn it over to the others. I mean, if, if, the, if, if the question is, is there an, uh, a non-immune related degenerative process in progressive MS happening? I think that is still very much an open question. And it's been debated in the field for quite a while. And if you look at the big pathology case studies like Claudio Bucanetti's, it's really a minority of patients where you don't find any evidence for immune dysfunction, let's call it that. Whether that's adaptive immune system or innate immune system, either you find antibodies or cells or microglia or complement, you usually find the smoking gun that is related to the immune system. So I personally am convinced that the, and that's perhaps the link to other neurodegenerative conditions that the innate immune system does play a key role in accelerating the pathology, the progressive pathology in MS. And there's lots of evidence that it plays a role in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other more common neurodegenerative conditions. So I do believe there's a spectrum here uh, and there's probably even from a, therapy development standpoint, um, an avenue to be pursued. So, so one of the targets that's coming up more and more is NRL P3, which, uh, which essentially is, uh, let's say the core, one of the core uh, inflammasome targets that actually could be common to a variety of these neurodegenerative conditions. Um, but, but whether that's gonna be, again, enough to cure, 
I don't think so because I don't think that's the only process at stake. Neither in MS nor in other neither, neither in other neurodegenerative conditions. Bruce, you talked about uh, the transmission of uh, frontotemporal dementia along uh, neurological uh, circuits and pathways, and this brings up uh, related to the inquest the question of infectious agents. That famous proteinaceous infectious agent discovered uh, by your colleague upstairs, Stan Prusner. So any comments on some of those links? I think you're muted. There so you go. so I think these diseases is very different and uh, uh, this, uh, the spread of these diseases is, is turning out to be very predictable. So I think in Bill Seeley's laboratory, he, he can really follow a, a neurodegenerative disease like frontotemporal dementia almost from one cell to the next. And, and I think that's what the path data in his laboratory looks like. So if you carry a, a gene like C9 or 72, certainly not a, a prion a gene, uh, and you start to develop neurodegenerative changes uh, they seem to begin in these very large layer five uh, neurons uh, that uh, are highly susceptible to the neurodegeneration and then spread out along these columns and then uh, eventually uh, spread out more, more widely. I think the pharmaceutical industry has really missed an opportunity in the trials with uh, C9ORF72 for ALS only because I think the uh, people who have ALS are uh, also vulnerable in these C9ORF72 neurons. So I think if you have, uh, if you have ALS, uh, but don't yet have symptomatic evidence for frontotemporal dementia, if you follow these people, they are going to develop frontotemporal dementia in, other, in these vulnerable neurons in the, in, in the insular region. So, so I, I think, uh, this is a real opportunity, I think, to think across systems uh, that degenerate uh, for whatever reason. And I think our understanding of selective vulnerability is very, very poor. But motor neurons and von Economo neurons are, are selectively vulnerable to this process. N not exactly infectious, but uh, progressive from one cell to the next. Does anyone want to uh, take a comment? Uh, you mentioned von Economo uh, neurons, but uh, in the last pandemic, 100 years ago, uh, afterwards, there was an extensive outbreak of post-encephalitic Parkinson's. Are we going to see that? I, I've thought a lot about this, so maybe I, I'll, I'll try it, Larry, but, but without any real wisdom. Um, so uh, there, there was a time in neurology, uh, uh, we're all a little young for this, but we're everyone believed that almost all Parkinson's was post-encephalitic. And there was even a very famous meeting where a man named David Postkanzer stood up and said, I will give anyone a, a case of champagne if they can show me a, a case of Parkinson's that was not due to the epidemic of 1918. So uh, anyways, he was wrong uh, and it uh, slowly uh, died out. So I think some people who think about this time think that there were two plagues. One was an influenza plague that was unrelated to the uh, post-encephalitic Parkinson's and then another virus presumably that led to the von Economo, I, I mean to the, uh, uh, to the post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease that uh, plagued the country for a long time. But uh, I don't think anyone knows. And, and I think looking back, uh, at those brains uh, would be very interesting and valuable. Thanks, I, I wanna make a brief digression. Uh, I did my neurology clerkship about 50 years ago with David Postkanzer, and although he was wrong on that case, he's a great example of a neurologist who made an enormous breakthrough in oncology. He was the one, the epidemiologist who showed the diethylstilbestrol is associated with early cancer. And it just uh, calls to attention another thing, uh, lobbying on behalf of neurologists, that the whole idea of uh, the immunotherapy of cancer was really first opened up by a guy named Jerry Posner, who discovered all these 
rare perineoplastic syndromes where the immune system was attacking cancer and attacking something in your brain. And he found out, he and his uh, students figured out what some of those molecules are. So uh, we have to all keep an open mind. And as Adrian said, not get into silos because we can uh, flub on our specialty, but if our eyes are wide open, we can make a discovery in some other area. Returning to the questions, I'm eating up uh, time. Uh, early diagnostics. Uh, the question is, there are more than uh, half a dozen companies and a dozen more academic labs working on blood tests, eye scans, cognitive evaluation apps, bone scans of the CSF, outflow channels. Uh, what are the prospects for some of those? I, I would just comment really briefly, Larry. I think, yes, they're emerging impressive diagnostics. I think uh, a couple caveats. You know, I think as a, a working neurologist, I think the blood or plasma will be critical, right? I mean, CSF remains a challenge. The eye scans have been, attempts have been around for a while. We'll see what happens, you know, more expensive and more time consuming. I think one, a second important caveat is the context. Excited about sensitivity and specificity and the technology of, of diagnostics, but the, 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 we don't see enough of age-related context or prior probability context. For example, a positive amyloid PET scan means something entirely different in a 50-year-old versus an 80-year-old, right? And so I think these studies have to mature to become age-specific. We know the powerful effects of prior probability in interpreting diagnostic studies. So I think they'll need to mature, but uh, yes, I mean, you know, they'll become very important. Thanks, Frank. In the last few minutes, I'd like everyone to, um, we have according uh, to my timepiece about uh, five minutes, so everyone uh, take a minute and a half. If we could circle back to the uh, metabesity uh, tenets, the major tenets here about uh, some of the common uh, comorbidities that relate to all the metabesic diseases and just comment about their impacts. We've mentioned it a bit, but uh, let's close with some uh, good thoughts about that. I, I might start with COVID and just make a comment. So, uh, you know, our, our, the populations that I look after are at unbelievable vulnerability and risk uh, with this uh, pandemic. And many of the risk factors for neurodegenerative disease are also risk factors for bad outcomes associated with COVID. Uh, some of us like me believe that this whole catastrophe could be, have been almost prevented uh, with a smart respect for science uh, and certainly uh, you know, this enormous suffering that has happened uh, across our, our country uh, uh, was, for the most part, uh, uh, could have been ameliorated or, or prevented if uh, we followed the scientific principles. Um, going back to the, you know, metabesity stories, I, I think there's a strong lesson here in that we, we need to spend more time thinking about with our patients and their caregivers, their own uh, physical vulnerabilities, whether it's uh, uh, midlife obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and the, you know, there's gold in those hills. We, we will uh, do huge good things for our, our populations if we think about those. But I think we also, I, I've learned during this time, we have to speak out when science uh, uh, is degraded by leadership. And, and, and that's been really one of the tragedies over, over the last seven, eight months. Thank you. Frank and Paolo? Yeah, I, just I, in terms of the metabesity, I think it's exciting that we're seeing such a remarkable overlap in mechanisms. Um, you know, with diet or with exercise, you know, we see peripheral immune effects that are tied in with CNS immune mechanisms in terms of microglial mechanisms, et cetera. Uh, with diet, uh, with exercise especially, uh, we see some of the pathways affected that I was describing that dictate synaptic uh, function, di dictate synaptic survival with the same metabolic changes induced by exercise uh, that are intrinsic to synapse. So the overlap is wonderfully and welcoming, remarkable. And I don't think we can ignore the metabesity mechanisms as, as we you know, target other mechanisms. Thank you. Paolo. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I think that, that um, you know, it, I think we need to come to the, come to the conclusion that the vision that we typically have that drugs are going to be the cure of neurodegeneration is, is fundamentally flawed. That you, you need the combination of uh, ther the therapeutics and other non-pharmacological uh, interventions such as lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. The, la the last really positive study that I saw in Alzheimer's was not a drug trial. It was a trial called the, the uh, you know, Finger Study, which is a trial run in Finland, where basically they take people at risk or with early Alzheimer's, and for months they treat them with a personal trainer that gets them to the gym two, three times a week on a steady diet, cognitive training, et cetera, They're, those interventions are as potent as the best pharmaceuticals we have now. And that's available. Not everybody can get a personal trainer, but meaning that lifestyle modifications by themselves with nothing else have a really, really strong therapeutic benefit. So it's hard to think how one can imagine treating millions of people with Alzheimer's, for example, with drugs alone when in fact there has to be a societal change and a personal lifestyle change that enables those therapeutics to be maximally effective. So again, this, this topic and you know, this conference could not be more topical right now. Thank you. And I think it's also important to remember that um, getting back to Bruce's comment about uh, risk factors in COVID, even in children, uh, one of the most uh, prevalent uh, and important comorbidities is obesity and obesity doesn't just start when you get old. It has to be something that's uh, ameliorated along the way. The other uh, aspects that we've touched on is the impact of uh, education and socioeconomic levels, which are linked, the less education, the lower socioeconomic levels. And of course, uh, the higher the incidence of obesity for uh, a variety of interesting and unfortunate reasons. Uh, but um, well-being, uh, economic well-being is uh, central uh, to dealing with metabesity. So uh, the pharmaceutical industry has a large role, we medical scientists do, but uh, getting back to uh, Congresswoman uh, Shalala, the political process can change things a lot and move the curves more than uh, we may be able to in the short run. Uh, ultimately, we may get to those so-called uh, cures. So we're reaching the end of our time. I want to thank all the panelists. It's been um, enlightening and illuminating, and I hope the uh, hundreds and hundreds of people out there uh, enjoyed it as well. I'll turn it back to Thomas. Larry, thank you so much. And the Pat Neurodegenerative Panel, fantastic panel. Thank you so much, particularly Paolo calling in from Basel, I think, late in the night. I uh, hope that you are able to raise your glass of port uh, with our appreciation.